So welcome back. Um, this is our last class of, of this round. So we're into the fourth foundation of mindfulness, reading the Satipatthana Sutta in Analayo's translation. And um, since last time, um, and this is partly for everyone out there at TV land. Hi, everybody in TV land. Um, since the video cut out in the middle a little bit, um, and just to review, uh, I'm just going to give a, just a tiny overview of kind of where we've been, and then we'll plunge on into, into the fourth foundation. So I won't say much about the first foundation. We talked a lot about it in the first couple classes. Um, but the first foundation orienting us and grounding us in the body to begin. And as, as asana practicing yogis, this is, uh, this is huge for us. Right? This is really the center of our practice is how do we use the body, to awaken, how do we ground into the body, um, into our presence in the body? So, um, so the opening practices on body, beginning with breath, um, as we did in the meditation just now, and often, in really, really, especially these first four instructions, you can really use this opening quartet of breath instructions as basic meditation instructions. So from the beginning of the sutta, there's you know, there's the instruction on sitting down, right? You find the root of a tree, always a good place to sit. Um, or an empty hut, right? The studio can serve as an empty hut. Uh, you know, you don't do it in the middle of the mall or like in the marketplace. Right? It's too, too crazy. But, you know, the root of a tree, nice and quiet, empty hut. And, and you get your, your posture instructions, right? Sitting down, cross-legged, setting the body erect. So everything we know in yoga about the balance of alertness and, and softening right, from Patanjali is going to be applicable here. You balance uh, sukham and stiram, alertness and ease in the pose, brightness and ease, stability and softening, receptivity. And then establishing mindfulness in front, right, bringing mind, the activity of mindfulness to the foreground. And then it just begins this long list of practices you would do once you've settled into, into your seat, into your place. So ever mindful, she breathes in. Ever mindful, she breathes out. This, this first quatrain, um, breathing in long breath and short breath, you know, oh, this breath is long, this breath is short. Kind of tracking, you know how sometimes there's a whole bunch of short breaths and then there's one really long one that's kind of physiological thing that happens. You would just note, right? You're not just noting in and out, but oh, here's the long breath coming back. And it, again, it brings you closer to the breath, more intimate with the breath. And then you begin to train. Uh, she trains uh, breathing into the whole body, feeling the breath in the whole body. And a wonderful monk right now, and a little tradition of full body breathing. And just to say, there's a uh, where you attend to the breath is a point of, you know, minor but potent scholastic contention in the Buddhist world, because, you know, it's rather Talmudic and you can split hairs any way you want. And some people really believe that you, that, you know, the best place is to, is to attend to the nose tip. And some people believe that the thing to do is to track the breath going into the body and filtering down and then going back up and out, and that's great. And some people say, you know, no, 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 you should breathe at the abdomen. And, and feel the abdomen rising, falling with the breath. They're all great. Try them all. It's fabulous. Find which one stills the mind, feels juicy in your body. Um, I've been really enjoying, for some years now, studying with um, a monk named Tanisaro, who uh, teaches down at a Thai tradition temple outside of San Diego called Wat Metta, uh, or Metta Forest Monastery. He's an American who studied in Thailand. And he teaches uh, full body breathing as, um, as this first inst instruction. Uh, and he really emphasizes that this, this third piece of the breathing instruction speaks to the whole body breathing. And so rather than focusing on any one place, the belly or the chest or the nose, you focus on the sense of the whole body breathing. And he'll come into it in different ways, sometimes sensing different parts of the body breathing, kind of moving through the body. Can you feel the breath in the side of the belly? Can you feel it up here, back here? and moving toward a sense of the whole body. And sometimes I'll, I'll really use this in asana, where especially in a, in a pose where I'm holding, 
can I just pause and not even so much feel like the big chest breath, which is which Ujjayi Pranayama brings us toward often, but can I feel the whole body breathing in and out? It's like the skin of the legs exhaling and inhaling and really have a sense of the whole body in the shape while breathing. So if you train feeling the whole body and then training calming the bodily formation. So allowing breath to calm the body, um, which really means calming body and mind both, and they settle. Right. And then the whole list of the body contemplations. So the four postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, all the activities, extending the limbs, coming back, eating, shitting, falling asleep, talking, keeping silent. The parts of the body, as we've talked about before, right? just noting all the different, like deconstructing the body into its, into its elements, and then the cardinal elements, air, earth, fire, water, and then the corpse in decay. So noting the reality that this body is not exempt from the reality of everything to return to the cardinal elements, to, to return to earth. So, uh, and really there's the sense in the text, and the, this comes out in the commentaries, that, that any of the foundations of mindfulness you can take kind of all the way. So it's not like you have to master every single one of these practices, and we're going to get into a whole bunch of things today in the fourth foundation, but that, um, but that these are all, in a way, these are all doorways, and they're all places that you could go in. And so you might find that, you know, you might find, for instance, that, that the meditation on the elements really speaks to you. Like, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. So there's these four things, that's all that there is. And you just start to orient around that and be mindful of, you know, oh, this is the quality of earth manifesting now. This is the quality of water. And just doing that over and over and over, right, the insights that the tradition leans toward, noticing that everything is impermanent, arising and passing, noticing that, that nothing can be clung to as providing lasting satisfaction, noticing that nothing can be uh, reliably called a self will come out of that reflection. It will come out of the reflection on the corpse dissolving. It will come out of the reflection on breath. So you can take any one of these um, a long way. It's not that like breath is the beginner's practice and then you get onto, you know, bones with blood dripping off them as the advanced practice, the advanced tantric practice. You like that one? <laughs> Some blood coming off. Um, so, uh, but there are these different bright doorways in. Reminders. So the second foundation, uh, Vedana, or feeling tone. No noticing that every sensation, so every taste, every smell, every sound, every visual image, every physical sensation brought in through the body, and every thought and emotion um, comes with a valence of pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant, or neutral. And it's often quite subtle. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes it's very obvious. But the mindfulness of feeling tone, as we were talking about in the yoga practice, in the asana practice, points us toward the insight into our preferences and our habits. It really points us toward recognizing, grasping and aversion as they arise, moment to moment. And, and this contemplation is, again, it's super powerful. It's a wonderful doorway in to inquiry and and one of the things that's powerful about it like the breath contemplation is that it's always happening so different from say the corpse contemplation where you have to visualize something but we're not always in the presence of rotting corpses um, we are always in the presence of the breath we notice it or we don't and we're always in the presence of vedana and there's always i could always Pick some sensation right now, you know, um, the image of David writing in his notebook, and that visual image will automatically come with some very subtle valence of pleasant or unpleasant. You know, maybe I know, oh, he's taking notes. Maybe that means I'm saying something smart, and maybe I like that, so then there's a little pleasant Vedana, you know. Or maybe I, maybe what if he's 
writing down, you know, mean questions to ask later that will kill me. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, you know, nervous because I have self-doubt and that's unpleasant, right? So who knows? It's all conditional, right? It's not like writing in the notebook is in itself, in and of itself, Heidegger would say, um, intrinsically pleasant or unpleasant. But for me, in my conditioning, it's always going to come with one of those. And, you know, honestly, it's mostly neutral, right? It's right in there somewhere. But there's some, I like it. It's like, okay, it's slightly pleasant. Nice. And I could be mindful of that. And that's a fairly neutral example, so I might not be grasping onto it much. But if it were slightly more charged, say, if I had slightly more, you know, neurotic habits around it, choose whatever it is for you that you have, you know, it's relatively minor, but actually you know, you get a little worked up. And you can notice, oh, I'm noticing, rather than sliding down the habit, like, you know, water slide into, into, ah, I must be teaching great because he's taking notes. And I didn't notice the whole pathway to getting to that thing which has a, a flavor of grasping to it. I could just notice, I'm seeing David writing, and then I'm noting that it's pleasant. And doing that, I won't pour into the, re the reaction to it. I'm not reacting. You know? And again, it's a fairly innocuous example, so it doesn't matter much. But, um, but you know what the example is for you, where you, know, you note, where you missed noting pleasant or unpleasant in something, and suddenly you were just doing it. You were just doing the ooh, or ah, or whatever you were doing. And we do this all the time. So Vedana is really the doorway into that insight in a wonderful way. Preference. The third foundation, the foundation of mindfulness of mind, uh, or sometimes uh, mindfulness of mental states, which I like a little bit better. It's a little, it's a little bit more descriptive for me. And so knowing the presence or absence of these particular, uh, particular of Mind states in general, we can generalize from this foundation, but in particular, the presence and absence of these states that um, are potent in relation to our, our liberation or non-liberation. So, um, you know, a grasping, aversive, or deluded mind. So the first three mind states uh, coincide with the three poisons. Um, grasping, aversion, and delusion. So you note the, the presence of one of those Poisons, maybe poisons is in quotation marks, but uh, unskillful or unwholesome, perhaps, unuseful. I don't like unuseful, but let's say unwholesome uh, mind states or their absence. So noting, oh, the absence of greed. And the commentaries make a point of saying that being mindful of the absence of the poison of greed or grasping is not only just the simple absence of it, but it also refers to all the beneficial qualities that are its opposite. So noting the presence, for instance, of dana or generosity would be a way of noting the absence of grasping. You know, if I'm, if I'm enthusiastically ready to give a large donation to, to a community who really needs it, and there's nothing in me that's contracting away from doing that, I could note, mindfully, that there's not only the absence of grasping onto my material resources, but there's the presence of this wholesome quality of generosity. So, um, in another, maybe more neutral situation, I might note the absence of grasping, but not the, present, not the strong presence of something else. So I might just note a more neutral mind state. And this is a little bit what Thich Nhat Hanh points to when he says, you know, uh, Oh, no one's ever mindful of the fact that you don't have a toothache. But it's wonderful, right? Because if you think about having a toothache, it's very unpleasant. But you're not noticing that you have the wonderful pleasure right now of not having a toothache. And so, you, you know, so we, we can all say, you know, um, uh, you know, pick some ferocious, you know, deadly disease that you don't have. You know, like, I don't know. Japanese encephalitis, to pick one that I don't think anyone has here. Tell me if so, and I'll use a different example. Um, but it's a disease that you get from hanging around near pigs in Southeast Asia. And so, you know, they were like, well, you can either get this $300 vaccine, or you can just not go where there's pigs. And we're like, we'll just skip the pigs. Like, it was easy. You're going to India, skip the pigs. And you're skipping Japanese encephalitis. Um, I didn't manage to skip dengue fever, so... 
you know, unpleasant Vedana. Um, but you could note, oh, not having Japanese encephalitis is pleasurable. And you might note the absence of that disease. In the same way, you could say, oh, I'm, I'm not angry right now. I, there's no rage in me right now, or not much, anyway. And so I could note the absence of that. And, and maybe even I could note the, the presence of the opposite of rage, which would be you know, a kind of a love or kind-heartedness. So the beginning of mindfulness of mind is to note those three qualities or their, or their opposites. And then noting the presence of, of a couple of basic, um, uh, also difficult mind states, um, contracted and distracted. Those refer to the hindrances of sloth and torpor and restlessness. And then the series of, um, the series of uh, wholesome mind states, as you practice along the path and the mind gets concentrated and wide and wise, you might note the presence of a, a mind that is great or its opposite narrow, a mind that is surpassable or unsurpassable. These refer to specific specific moments in the tracking of the mind as it deepens in concentration. Um, we can generalize to noting positive mind states in general. And then also, if you, if you want to get super technical, we can talk about how you, know, you note the qualities that are present as you exit second jhana and enter third, and how you have to release one quality in order to deepen. Da, da, da. That's where the commentaries go. Um, I'm not a hella expert in that depth of concentration, but I can send you to people who are if that's your bailiwick. Um, so those are the first three foundations, and then last week we started in on the fourth foundation, which is a list of, it's a list of lists. And so in a sense, the fourth foundation is a great overview of several of the basic kind of formulations in early Buddhism. And, and they're lists that are guidelines for us as we practice. So the first list is the guideline of the hindrances. Um, so the five classic um, things that get in the way as we practice. Grasping an aversion of the first two, holding on, pushing away an aspect of our experience. Three and four are sleepiness and restlessness. Sleepiness, traditionally called sloth and torpor. And restlessness is restlessness and worry. And then the fifth one, uh, the sneakiest demon of them all, which is doubt. And that can be self-directed or externally directed, doubt. Um, is very sticky. And so we talked a little bit last week about the hindrances and how you practice with them. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about the relationship of these early practices that in a sense require a certain distance or removal from what's happening and later developments, especially in Tantra, in which there's, a, there's more of an embracing or, a, or a, a different kind of intimacy with what's happening. And in relation to the hindrances, then, I'll say that I'll remember my teacher, Eugene Cash, saying, uh, well, the first thing we have to do is to agree that there's no such thing as a hindrance. And then we can talk about the hindrances. So there's a way that you understand that, that it's not that there's something intrinsically, again, in itself, wrong with or bad about, or even to be avoided in a certain way about, say, sleepiness or restlessness. But you recognize it's just part of the condition that we're in. And it's grist for practice like anything else, right? If you're one of the people that just sits down and immediately your mind is concentrated and still and you have nothing to do, um, you might become quite free quite quickly. Um, you might also be a terrible teacher because you don't actually understand the path at all. And there are and the, the tradition speaks of people who self-awaken but never teach because they're not actually connected to the challenge of the path. They just dropped away. And those kind of teachers, people usually chase them, chase them around, you know, because they're, they're quite fun to be around. Um, but they're often a little short on specifics. Um, and so uh, the benefit of studying with a teacher like me, I'll just say, is that you're studying with someone who knows the hindrances very well. Um, and has worked with them and continues to work with them for decade upon decade. So there's at least some familiarity there. Don't they, there is something about each of the hindrances has its kind of opposite side in wisdom? Is there some, or yes. it, am I talking about something different? There's two things about that, kind of what the, 
In the early texts, the hindrances are often paired with their antidote, not so much with a wisdom. So like the antidote to doubt is faith. Mm. You know? um, some of them are obvious that the antidote to sleepiness is energy, duh. Like, if I had energy, I wouldn't be sleepy. <laughs> but then, you know, you're given things to do. Like, when you're sleepy, there's specific antidotes that you can do, like looking up at the, at the open sky, um, opening the eyes wide, being percipient of light, so really attending to where there's light in the room. Uh, of a classic one that I like is pulling on your earlobes. You pull on your ear, it'll, it'll wake you up. It's really nice, you pull on your earlobes. Um, especially if you have big old dangly earlobes, you can just, you know. Um, so... So that's how they appear mostly in the early texts, and somewhat later on. Um, and this, you know, this appears a little bit in the early texts, but it'll really get expanded in the tantras, where these qualities carry with them, uh, really embedded in them, a kind of wisdom. So, uh, and especially not even so much the hindrances, but the the difficult emotions carry oh, them. Okay, that's what I was thinking. That's that's probably the yeah. the reference that you're remembering. So, for instance, anger which in the early texts is mostly a very difficult state to be you know, worked with carefully and mm -hmm. seen with mindfulness and a little bit of distance and never acted on and, and um, worked with, fairly, you know, with fair, a fair amount of delicacy in a certain way because it's very powerful. The tantras will say, let her rip. Don't hurt anybody. But you know, really feel that energy and that you can transform, or the tantric word is transmute, that energy into its bright quality, which is um, discrimination. So anger, right? I hate this. If you take away the hating part, it's, I see what this is very clearly, right? And that energy can then become, you know, the sword of wisdom. <sighs> cuts through, right? And it cuts through delusion, right? And as you know, when you're angry, you often see the situation very clearly, although you're, you're a little bit blinded by fire, if you take away the blinding and you just have the fire, then you have a very powerful stance in relation to that thing. I think this is a wonderful way to work. I don't think it's incompatible with the early texts. I think that you have to know what it is before you can do that. So in a way, this is, you have to do this first, in a way. I have to know what anger feels like before I can do any kind of transmuting. And if I don't have that basic task down, if I'm not actually aware of the presence of anger, which I could, maybe is like, you know, is strong aversion in a certain way. So I could, I'm not, I've, I've missed noting aversion, and the anger has taken me over. Because of that missing, I won't be able to do that, that spin. Because there's, there's a little pulling back also in the transmuting, right? Because I can't pour forward into the story of, of how I was done wrong. I have to actually be like, wow, I am angry. And I'm going to take that anger like right into the spine, right into the center, and just like burn a little bit. And then I'll have this clarity to act, but I'm not falling off my center. So to not fall off your center requires knowing what's happening, and that's what we're doing. So that's kind of how they, how they relate. Cool. So let's go on. Um, um, it's very nice, I think, to do an overview, and of course this means that um, we have very little time left to get through the text, but we'll, uh, we'll read it and we'll, we'll see where we go. Um, let's read the aggregates, so at the bottom of page 9. I have a volunteer to read the aggregates, nice and loud. Go for it. Again, monks, in regard to Damas, she abides contemplating Damas in terms of the five aggregates of clinging. And how does she, in regard to Damas, abide contemplating Damas? in terms of the five aggregates of clinging. Here she knows, such is material form, such its arising, such its passing away, such is feeling, such its arising, such its passing away, such its cognition, such its arising, such its passing away, such are volitions, such their arising, such their passing away, such is consciousness, such its arising, such its passing away. Great. And then the refrain that we're used to. So the aggregates are a wonderful practice. And they're a way of beginning to deconstruct the world. 
So the aggregate consists of five things. It gets a little obscure here, at least for a five minute thing, but we'll do our best. Um, the aggregates are a way of recognizing that our experience can be framed in terms of these five basic experiences. The first is form, which includes everything physical, both our body and the, and the physical earth and every object we come into contact with, physical sensation, and all five of the physical-based sensations. So all of that falls under the, the category of form, right? So the entire mindfulness of the body falls under form, right? Moving through the world, everything that's not mental or emotional, essentially, is there. The second of the aggregates, and the, the Pali and Sanskrit word for this is skanda, um, or skanda is the Sanskrit, kanda, K-H-A-N-D-A is the Pali. Um, it's a word if you hang around in Buddhist circles, you'll hear a lot. The second of these um, is feeling, or vedana, which we've talked about before, is the second foundation of mindfulness. So again, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. The third is uh, sanya, and it's perception. Perception here refers to the, the bare quality of recognition. So not getting into any other level of what's happening mentally, but just recognizing. So when I look over at you and I see your glasses resting on your text, not getting into any other bit of content, but just the way that there's seeing, right? And so that's form. And it comes along with Vedana. Some, it's fairly neutral for me, so, but it's somewhere in there, pleasant, unpleasant. Perception is, the, is just the thing in me that knows glasses, right? So this is based on my conditioning. It's based on how I've learned that those are glasses when I was a kid, whatever. And it's based on the conditions of their having come together, right? I'm not seeing them as a lens separate from some plastic, separate from some, some dye, whatever, right? But it's a thing, and I just see glasses. So perception is the mental faculty of pure recognition uh, without anything else. The fourth of the khandas is, uh, here he calls volitions. Um, it's a complicated word to translate, um, sankhara. And um, it also refers to mental formations. It's a translation I tend to prefer. And basically, all of your thinking and emotions falls into this category. So when I see the glasses, there's form, there's some feeling tone, there's perception just of glasses. And then there's, there's everything else. There's you know, my whole relationship to my own vision or ideas about you know, uh, fashion in eyewear or anything, like everything that could be thought about that object is part of this fourth kanda. The associative mind. The all the associations, right? And it's related to karma in this way, right? So karmic formations is related to this formations. Um, everything, all the, all the web of associations that I have. So in a way, the fourth one, um, it's an odd list because the fourth one is huge and rangy, and some of them are quite precise, like, oh, perception, it's just boom. But in the, in the fourth kanda, like, is almost everything that happens. And the fifth one, consciousness, is again very simple. It's just the knowing of seeing it. So in the sea in the glasses, there's, perception says glasses, and it's, there's some way that I know that I'm seeing them. And to get more precise, it's that the perception glasses and the consciousness seeing glasses, or even the consciousness I am seeing glasses, appears at the same time. It's like it all, all of these five things appear all at once, basically. And the, th the way that it becomes a practice instruction is that I can use this teasing apart to recognize if there's any particular aspect of that that is the hinge of suffering for me. So am I like, for instance, if consciousness sees the glasses, knows them, oh, seeing glasses, and most of the suffering is going to come in essentially in the fourth of the skandhas in relationship to the others. Like, wow, I'm so grateful that I have 20-20 vision, I don't need glasses, maybe. Or, um, which is true, so there's some pleasure there, and I could, I could, be, I could cling to that, and there would be some suffering. I could also say, oh, glasses, I totally have a thing for girls in glasses. It's t adorable, you know, because I, you know, whatever, because I always had crushes on, on the smart girls who wore glasses, who knows? I could have that association, which is also true, 
And then I might be like, oh, glasses, that's so nice. You know, and there, there might be some clinging or at least a little, you know, pleasant. And it could lean both directions, all these different directions. All of that stuff happens in the fourth khanda. And so being aware of it, what we're starting to do is take apart a thing that we thought was, was seamless. Like, oh yeah, I just, I see your glasses. And the Buddha is saying, oh, you can, you can deconstruct that actually quite deeply into just the visual perception, just the sense of pleasant and unpleasant, just the perception itself. And this is a level of starting to take apart reality that begins to be very useful as we practice. Yeah, this is, so, yeah. So the fourth one, the, the kind of karmic thing there is the associations you make with something and kind of the story, that's where you start to build up the little story around it, is that? All, what? The story is that, in fact. All the stories live there and they're all based on conditions. Mm -hmm. So they're all based on karma. I don't want to distract you. Please. But would that level, if there's a collective level of consciousness and associations, would that be where art becomes effective in that it's activating our collective stories? Good one, right? Collective unconscious, art activating a collective story. I would have to say that yes, in the framework of the khandas, this is a very individual framework. Nobody can perceive with you, right? So when you see glasses and I see glasses, we're not seeing the same That's thing. personal association. Totally personal association, but we're part of an interpretive community such that we both understand enough of the same thing that we could communicate. You could make, you could make a dance about glasses, and I might see it and get it mm -hmm. if we share enough vocabulary. In that sense, what you would do as an artist is trigger you would trigger, you would make forms, you would trigger certain kinds of Vedana, hopefully pleasant, right, if you want me to like your work, who knows, and then you would be making kind, certain kinds of perception happen, part of your job is to shape what hits my perception field, mm -hmm. in order that our fourth khanda, in order that that volitional formation arises in a way that, that either connects us, or we learn from each other, or accesses us to a larger thing, Right? which the Buddha doesn't talk about much, uh, yeah, the collective level. Later on, the Mahayana Buddhists will talk about that more. But in relation to this map, all of it will happen in that fourth, in that fourth aggregate. And they're called aggregates just because they're a chunk of things coming together. So that fourth chunk contains all that stuff. It's a short answer to that. And that's a good question because it brings in really another level of... It brings in the question really of whether this is kind of strictly a personal practice or not. And I remember, you know, it reminds me of back in the first foundation when he says, and this shows up in the refrain, right? The practitioner practices this internally, externally, and both internally and externally. Mm -hmm. And so when I think both internally and externally in relation to um, a factor like this, I do think like, yeah, what does externally mean? Like, how do I connect with external perception or external karmic formation? And I could connect that like to a larger cultural meme in that way. The meme excavator. It's not, it sounds like a bad dental tool <laughs> <laughs> or mental tool. All right, so uh, let's go on. Um, he gives us this: the five uh, khandas, the five aggregates, as a way to deconstruct our experience. And then he just goes on and gives another way to deconstruct. So you can everything you're doing can break down into one of these five things. It can also break down into one of these next six things. And this one is in a way even, even easier, but it's the sense spheres. Um, so the five physical senses and the mind as the sixth. Um, let's just go around in a circle reading this one because um, there's several little paragraphs. Again, nice and loud. Why don't you start? So page 10, sense spheres. Again, monks, in regard to dhammas, he abides contemplating dhammas in terms of the six internal and external sense spheres. And how he does, and how does he, in regard to dhammas, abide contemplating dhammas in terms of the six internal and external sense spheres? Here he knows the eye, he knows form, and he, he knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. And he also knows how an unrisen fetter can arise, how an unrisen fetter can be removed and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. 
He knows the ear, he knows sounds, and he knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. And he also knows how an unrisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. He knows the nose, he knows odors, and he knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. And he also knows how an unarisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. He knows the tongue, he knows flavors, and he knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. And he also knows how an unarisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. We know the body. We know intangibles. Excuse me, tangibles. We know the fetter that arises dependent on both, and we also know how an unarisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. He knows the mind, he knows the mind objects, and he knows the fetter that arises dependent on both, and he also knows how an unarisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter can be removed, and how a future arising of Wonderful. So, again, we're, we're talking about dhammas. Dhammas, in this sense, are um, things or states that, um, that are, are both notable states unto themselves, or things to, to look at, and also aspects of the teaching, the dhamma, that are valuable for us to attend to. So six internal and external sense spheres. Here's internal and external again. So, um, you know, the sense of taste internally and externally, and through the five physical senses and the mind. So the example um, with the visual, we'll just look at the first one, and then it's the same for all of them. Here she knows the eye, she knows forms. So just that. In those two things, you're knowing the sense organ itself, the eye. So there's mindfulness just of the eye. And then there's knowing forms, so seeing what is meeting the eye. And she knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. So what does that mean? What's a fetter? It's something that catches you. It's something that catches you. It's like the chain. Yeah, I think, I think it was like the, like the, the thing, the ankle thing. Like it's a bond you're, with you're bound. A right. So the fetters, that's, it's, a, it's what's left over from an old Victorian translation. It's stuck with. It stuck with us. Um, the fetters are these, uh, you know, things that bind us on the path. And as you progress toward enlightenment, you let go of a series of ten fetters that go from the relatively, the relatively lightweight. One of the first ones to go is believing that uh, rites and rituals will accomplish liberation for you. So you stop believing in ritual. Um, that was the Buddha really making a stand against the Brahmins, yeah, yeah against the Vedas. Um, and it leads up to very deep fetters, and like one of the last ones to go, you know, is the sense of I itself, right? Is all comparison of myself to others in any way, thinking that, thinking in any way that the I exists, that the self exists. Um, so different levels of, of release as we drop away from these fetters. So um, she knows the fetter that arises dependent on the I and forms. In a way, we've been talking about this all along. The text is repetitive. It sort of shows it to us in different ways. This is like, yeah, when I see something, how do I get caught? What's the thing that catches me? Right? So, you know, you could think of a visual form um, that, say, has strong, pleasant vedana, something that you, that when you look at it, your whole system kind of goes, hmm, right? And then you could be mindful both of the eye, of the form, and having just come through the, the khandas, you could be mindful of Vedana, right? you could be mindful of all those aspects. And here it says, and you're mindful of the fetter, the, the, that which binds you, that arises dependent on that contact. So dependent on my looking at, you know, my friend Jay, there's the fetter that could arise dependent on that form, which would be something like, you know, Oh, I like Jay. I hope he doesn't move to Florida, you know, or something. You know, you never know. Always an option. 
<laughs> Always an option as we get older, you know. Florida looms is an option. Um, you know, uh, or, you know, I like my friends Ben and Shannon. They are moving to L.A., and I don't like that. So that I have a little fetter because I have a preference, right? And a fetter is just a strong word in a way for saying, I have a preference and I got stuck on it a little bit. There's nothing wrong with having preferences, right? It's actually great for me to have a preference that you stay. But, but if, I, if I get a little verklempt about it, and I'm like, I want them to go, then you know, my balance has been, has been swayed a little bit, right? So uh, um, I know the fetter that arises dependent on both, right? When I, uh, you know, when I, when I see the aisle of green and black chocolate bars, I know the fetter that arises dependent on the eye contact with the form, right? right? So, um, uh, then, like, we, like in, the, in the khandas, we didn't talk about this much in the khandas, right? Such as it's arising, such as it's passing away. Here it says how a fetter can arise, how it can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. So, how does a fetter arise? I see the Isle of Green and Black's chocolate, and I'm being skillfully mindful, I actually notice the seeing, the remembering, the pleasant association, the wanting, the leaning forward in time, the grasp, all these little aspects that we talked about in different ways. I know how that arises, right? So I'm mindful of the arising of that fetter. I know how that fetter is removed. So I've practiced actually being mindful of that and knowing what to do in relation to that. Like I tell myself, you know how you are with these things. You'll buy one, and then you're going to go home, and that's all we're going to do. I'm a renunciate. I'm a one chocolate bar renunciate. They're, they're still very expensive chocolate bars. I could be a deeper renunciate. But, <laughs> but, you know, I'm renouncing the possibility of buying ten in favor of buying one. Right? I'm, I'm applying wisdom or wise effort in that, in that moment. So I know how the, unarisen, how the arisen fetter can be removed, for me, it's mostly through inquiry, right? I just, I want to notice how I get caught. And that noticing and the intention to do something different is, is how that fetter is going to be removed. And, and then how a future unarisen fetter can be prevented might be, you know, today I'm not going to walk down that aisle. Mm-hmm. I've done enough of that this week. Like, I'm going around this time. I'm, I'm preventing even the arising of that whole situation. And so here we're really talking about a way that the early texts lean toward renunciation. So in our conversation about the tantras, it's very you know, different, it's very different it's, it's in this point. Yes. Right. It would be like, I'm going to put myself right in the middle of it and I'm going to burn up with that thing until I'm done with it. You know? Or until I learn something else about it. Or use that energy in a different way. You know? Or buy ten chocolate bars but give them all to Shiva at the puja and practice in a different way. Um, I'm quite fond of renunciation because I think it's very powerful, and it's not intuitive in our culture. Um, in fact, it's kind of hated in our culture. Nobody wants you to do this, right? If you, renun- if you renounce, you, you, you become an, a non-consumer, and you're not helping the economic recovery, <laughs> right? Um, so, so I think it, it, it's quite powerful in that way, but as practice, it's also, um, without getting deeply into that dialectic, which is interesting, like, what is more useful for you in a moment, right, to move toward that charged situation, that charged sensual situation or sensual contact, which all of this would be, or to, um, or to use your energy differently in that moment and divert. And I think actually just at different moments, different of those choices will be, will be valuable or useful for us. Some days I just can't deal with the energy of, like, charging into that fire again. Today I'm just going to go around the other aisle, you know. And other days it's like, there's nothing wrong with chocolate. And I'm going to go right there, and I'm going to, maybe I'll buy ten. And instead of renouncing on that level, I'm going to sit and eat them. And I'm going to stop at the moment when I know it's right. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to not be afraid of it at all. And I'm going to be in that. And maybe I'll just buy a hundred and have a chocolate party, and we'll compare and contrast. Because I really want to learn something about this, you know. And of course, you can do this on any level with any sense contact. And that's actually a really sort of practical application of, of 
the philosophy in a way, isn't it? I mean, I think like when you, it, isn't that what you kind of want to do with this sort of anyhow? Is, isn't that kind of how you, you sort of stop the suffering is if you, you begin to see how this kind of drags you along or pushes you away and then if you start to see those tendencies then you can sort of, it's this kind of practical application of it. It's totally practical. That's exactly what we're doing. You want to see that stuff. There's no, you know, there's no Ten Commandments in Buddhism. It's like, there's no, like, thou shalt eat right. No. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, thou shalt, you know, notice what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, there's, because there's no commandment, there's also no, like, there's no ethical kind of hinge to it. You can go in the direction of ethics and you can say, which is more harming or non-harming to on whatever level you want, my body, the environment, socio-eco-political, you know, fair trade politics, however you want to go with it, you could say, what choice would I make in this moment faced with the chocolate aisle that would, that would be most conducive of non-harm, right, of ahimsa? And you could choose that on, on lots of levels. One thing that, that I think is possible in a, you know, in our kind of progressive, very thinking about things like that culture is that I might make a certain choice like, well, I just don't do imported, you know, luxury items. Like, I don't believe in shipping chocolate from the, the Amazon. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a fine, righteous stance. And it's not my stance, although I would support one to take it because I think it is righteous. I, would, I might also say, that's nice. That's a very nice black and white stance. Is taking that stance allowing you to not address the fact that you crave this thing and you're actually using your politics to make it easier on yourself rather than actually standing there and letting yourself vibrate with wanting and figure out something about why you're suffering. So I think you know the different tools and the tantric tools arrived because people said like we need more tools in relation to really fiery things like food and sex and drugs and you know strong emotions. So we're going to make up these new tools where you like take it into your body and you mix it around and you explode it out and see what happens. Right? And this was several thousand years before and they were a little like, oh, those are strong emotions, you know. Are you aware of them? Like it's very basic. And later on these, these more complicated tools came around. Kind of, this was like screwdriver and hammer. And later on, you know, power tools and like, <laughs> you know, laser cutters showed up to get into your experience with. Um, the last thing I'll say about the sense spheres is that um, just to recognize that the mind is a sense sphere as well. So thinking, mind objects, is the last category here. So in the same way that I might with you know, the visual that I could grasp onto, how often does it happen that a thought arises? Where does it come from? I don't know. But a thought arises and something in it is sticky for you. you know, oh, the thought of my future success or the thought of how much I like this person or the thought about any, or how much I hate these other people or whatever it is. And all the things that we've been investigating apply to a thought just as much as to a physical sense. So a thought comes with a pleasant or unpleasant vedana. It comes with perception and recognition. It comes with a fetter if it's strong and there's an, a fetter arising. And all the things that you practice with an external sense, you can also then practice on your thoughts. And it's harder. Partly because you think they're you. And so one of the side effects that's wonderful um, of practicing in this way is that you start to recognize that your thoughts aren't you, that there's stuff like anything else. That's why both in the skandhas, in that fourth uh, khanda of volitions or you know, mental objects, um, thoughts are inclu included there and then they're included in the sense spheres as well. All right, tearing on. <laughs>